Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, where I run a vertically integrated projects team called Retrofuturistic Hardware, Music, Gaming, and Computing. This video is addressed to students who are joining in the fall 2024 semester. It lists a bunch of project ideas, although you are not restricted to these ideas. You can pitch your own ideas. I would also welcome folks in the YouTube community to pitch project ideas in the comments below, particularly if you're interested in sending us equipment and or otherwise interested in sponsoring a project. I'm interested in exploring alternatives to C++, and by that I mean languages that don't have built-in garbage collection. So I've had students look at the V language and look at Zig, and I would love for one or more students to take a look at the Odin programming language. In particular, this apparently has bindings for the Vulkan 3D API, and so this is very relevant to my interests. So I received a donation of a bunch of Tektronix test equipment. These are basically little modules and they plug into a rack unit like this. And I did some initial triaging indicating whether something would power on or not, or not power on. Figure we can try calibrating these, repairing the ones that don't come on. I have notes here like power's on, but smells bad. Probably needs some repairing. Itty bitty oscilloscope. We also have a bunch of other really old test equipment. Stuff kind of like this. Look at that giant knob. And the question I want to ask about this gear is, will it music? Will it music is a question coined by German composer Heinbach concerning using test equipment that isn't designed with musical applications in mind to make music. The way that pioneers like Stockhausen had to in the days before Moogs and Buchlas. So I think it would be cool to put together an electronic music studio in this old school style. Okay, so this is the MSI 8080. It normally has a front panel that looks like this. This is the computer that you might have seen in the movie War Games. And this is one of a class of computers called S100 bus. And that's the name of this bus. So an S100 bus system basically just consists of a power supply and this big bus. And you were meant to put cards in here to do various this, that, or the other. So this is the example of a card. This is a modern card. It has an original 8080 processor, but it also has an SD card slot that emulates a hard drive. And I have another S100 bus chassis down here. This is by Chromemco that we can put cards in and make computers. This is sort of an all-in-one kind of card that has some processors and a little bit of memory and it has a monitor ROM, and it has various bits of I.O. And here's some original cards that came with the MSI. So this is a 8080 processor card. And let's see, this is a serial interface card. So this is like talking to a terminal. Nowadays, you would use a computer for your terminal. So that's kind of funny. Now, in the olden days, you would actually have a terminal that was called a dumb terminal you would use to talk to the computer. These are memory cards, so you would add memory cards. And this is a disk controller card that some previous VIP students had modified to change it, I think, from 8-inch drives to use 5 and a quarter inch drives. I forget exactly what they're up to. Anyway, I have a large collection of these cards because I'm kind of obsessed with S100 bus computer systems. And so the goal would be to test out cards and repair them, make sure that they're working, and build computers out of them and have them do cool stuff. This is a good project for learning the Z80 kind of instruction set. The Z80 was one of two processors that were very popular in the late 70s and early 80s, the other one being the 6502. And here you can actually, in a very old school way, you can enter information into the machine with these switches in binary and read the output here in binary. Although, of course, generally you would be hooking up other things to it to be hooking up to a terminal and such. Oh, and these are old school eight inch floppy drives. So here's an example of an eight inch floppy. 
and I would really like to get these going. That would be cool. And this is a card made by a former VIP student. This is basically an Arduino. So you could interface an Arduino type processor to the bus. And over here, the same student made this card with an FPGA development board. So you can interface this to the bus to replicate various bits of functionality. And this here is a Vector3 S100 bus system. So this is kind of a later generation. The earlier S100 bus systems, you were sort of expected to buy some cards and put together your own system. If we open this up, which I'm not gonna do now, there's a little card chassis in here with S100 bus cards in it. And the idea is that some companies started making complete turnkey systems where there would be a set of cards that would just all work together and it was a little less DIY. So this represents sort of a transition between, I guess you could say, home computers that were essentially educational, experimental things that you couldn't really do anything with. And then the early home computer systems that were all in one appliances that you could just take home, plug in and turn them on like the TRS-80 and the Apple II and the Commodore PET. I really like this system because everything's working. So we can plug other cards into here, make sure they're compatible with existing cards and, and easily test those cards. This card here is an extender card. So you can plug in while the thing's running and measure signals and stuff on a card. Anyway, this would be a good project for somebody wanting to really learn about the guts of computers. So the idea about this is this is a set of knobs and sliders that I got out of a MIDI controller where the main keyboard had died. Anyway, I pulled this out and one student made this nice box for it. And using this Arduino, we were able to read the sliders and the knobs and send data over the Arduino serial connection, interpret that via a program, and then produce MIDI data to go into another app but what I would like to be able to do is replace this Arduino with a fancier controller that has built-in real USB that can provide MIDI over USB data so it can be used directly as a MIDI controller. So that would be an interesting project. Okay, so what is this? This is a development board with the W65C265 microcontroller, which is a microcontroller based on the 65816 processor. The 65816 itself is a 16-bit extension of the famous 6502 processor. The 65816 was used in the Apple II GS and the Super Nintendo, and this forms the basis for what I call the Retcom 87 project, which is to build a homebrew kind of computer built around the 65265 development board here. So I made these little add-on boards, one of them here, adds video using the Texas Instruments TMS9118 processor. And there's another board here that adds some audio, some music playing capability. And one of my students on this project has managed to write a fourth interpreter for it, write a simple BIOS so he can actually hook a PS2 keyboard up to this, type on it, and then display characters using this and write fourth programs. It's really amazing work. And so I would like to keep doing cool stuff with this. This would be great for if you want to learn assembly language programming. The 65816, as I mentioned, is based on the 6502. And the 6502 is a very common processor along with the Z80 that I mentioned earlier. So if you learn 6502, you can program a lot of retro systems. This is a fairly obscure game console called the Arcadia 2001. It uses a very weird processor, but the main thing here is that these controls use sort of a foil mechanism, and internally, these have just completely disintegrated. I really have no idea how to repair these. If anyone online here has any suggestions, let me know, but my, my main idea here is to just build a whole new controller somehow, some way, you know, with the appropriate interface. So it does have a connector that this unplugs, but it's inside the unit. So you actually have to take the screws off the back here to get to it, but we don't have to do any soldering or de-soldering to this. 
So this might be good for somebody interested in building controllers. This is an NEC PC-98. It was a computer that was only released in Japan. So it's got a bunch of Japanese stuff here on the keyboard. Anyway, the main reason I got this is because I got this. This is a PC FXGA card, and this basically contains the chipset of a console called the NEC PCFX that allows you to run PCFX games. And NEC released a consumer development kit so that we could write our own games. Now, the documentation is mostly in Japanese. Fortunately, I had a student who joined for several semesters who is a native Japanese speaker who was able to translate a lot of the documentation into English. And so the goal here is to try to get some NEC PCFX games running. I should note that the NEC PCFX was a failed game console. It was not released outside of Japan. And it basically got obliterated by the original Sony PlayStation. Anyway, NEC made the bet that 3D graphics hardware at the consumer level wasn't good enough at the time. So they put their emphasis on full motion video decoding, thinking that was the future of gaming. And obviously they guessed wrong. Anyway, I have an obsession with failed game consoles and consoles that had some sort of consumer SDK available for them that was approved by the manufacturer. So I had to buy this. So what's in the box here? This is a Magnavox Odyssey 2. This is basically a competitor of the Atari 2600, and it had a really interesting sort of architecture. It had a 8048 processor, which is a little weird, and it had a graphics chip that had some different graphics characters built into it. And it had some games that were these weird hybrid video game board game things, like this thing here called Quest for the Rings. They made this computer intro cartridge that involved learning how to write assembly code, but this isn't 8048 assembly code. This is a special assembly programming language that they made up just for this game. I can't think of anything else quite like it. Anyway, I think it would be fun to try to write software for it. So the first step would be to get an emulator running for it and to get some kind of development environment for it running on your PC some sort of assembler, compiler, whatnot, and try to write some games. And then maybe we can make our own ROMs or make some sort of doodad that we can load our own programs into here. I think that would be fun. We also have the Synthesizer Education Project, which involves designing usually analog synthesizer circuits to go in modules, often in a URAC format, like this own Martineau Wave Shaper. Here I'm experimenting with basically the Eurorack overall size, but using the Buchla format, where we have bananas for control signals. And I think here we're actually using something called tinny jacks, if I remember right, which are actually a little bigger than Eurorack 3.5 millimeter for audio signals. And here's an example of a board by Ken Stone. And let's see, they really should have used stranded wire here, but I won't complain about that now. Anyway, this involves designing front panels for synthesizers, designing circuit boards, building things, wiring things up, all kinds of fun stuff. So if you like to get your hands dirty with hardware, this is nice. And yeah, we have all sorts of stuff that needs to be integrated with front panels. I'm also interested in music software. In particularly, I have some students that have been looking into making plugins for digital audio workstations using the Juice framework. One thing I would like us to get a better handle on this semester is how to handle presets and understand how plugin parameters can be exposed in the DAW in order to be automated in the DAW. There's a higher level framework for making plugins called Highs that actually sits on top of Juice that I'm interested in exploring. And there's a program called Voltage Modular by Cherry Audio that I really want to investigate further. It lets you create modules using the Java programming language and a really well thought out SDK using something called Voltage Module Designer. And fortunately, you can get started with this for free. We have a group of students that have been making a game in the Godot engine. And there's another group of students working on a game for the Nintendo DS. 
And if you're interested in wearable technology, there are some students working on one vaguely inspired by the Fallout aesthetic, although they're not trying to make it look like a Pip-Boy. It's its own thing. 